So let's start in to present the programming language that will be the topic of the first few lessons of this course. Julia is one of the three leading open source languages that are today used in data science, with the other two being R and Python. Indeed, the same name of UPTER notebook, a tool that is commonly used in data science tasks, is an acronym derived by Julia, Python and R. This isn't to claim that uh, there aren't uh, uh, other languages uh, that are used. Uh, others are uh, as well as MATLAB, Java, C, C++ or even Fortran. By, but uh, uh, R, Python and Julia are the most common. What is really interesting is, if you see here, I put the years when the programming language has been released. And you can see that of the three, Julia is by far the youngest, having barely 10 years, while both Python and R have more than 30 years of development. So Julia is relatively young compared with the other two languages. I am now going to discuss the key principles that have driven the Julia development, the key characteristics on this column on the left, and the effect that they have for the user, for the programmer, on this column on the right. It's going to be a very high level discussion. We will go into the details when we'll study the language syntax in the next lessons. The first important thing is that Julia is an interactive programming language. That is, you use it from a terminal or from an editor, running the commands one by one. Uh, you can, if you wish, run the whole script at once, like you would do for other languages or for compiled languages. But you can also decide to run a command, see the output, and based on this one, decide what else to run in an interactive fashion. This really helps exploratory works. It is a dynamically typed language where the same variable can be associated, rebinded to objects of different types during the program flow. And you don't need to explicitly give the type of uh, uh, these objects. However, Differently from interpreted language, the code you write is compiled just in time. The first time that an execution of it is required, or even earlier with pre-compilation. And if the compiler can infer the type of the object, it can reuse the compiled specialized version for successive calls of the, of the code. If you write, for example, x equal 1.5, you don't need to write that x is a float, a decimal number, but this information is inferred from the fact that you did type a float. The technology that hallowed this just-in-time compilation is not actually from Julia itself, but from the underlying compiler that Julia uses, namely LLVM. Just in time compilation has been a very important progress in the IT industry. And notice here that I wrote the year where LLVM became available, 2003. What does it mean? Notice that 2003 is well after Python and R became av available but before Julia. Now, both Python and R are trying to use LLVM and add just-in-time compilations to solve their typical problems of uh, interpreted languages and become more efficient. But they have a huge problem, that is, that it has been designed before. And having been designed before the rising of just-in-time compilers means that the their design is not compatible with it. 
It's really hard for the designer of the language, for the maintainers of the language to hallow just-in-time compilation because the dynamic parts of the languages are such that yes, you can use just-in-time compilation in, certain, in some circumstances. There are several projects that use Python in particular, PyPy, Numba, but also recently are for just-in-time compilation. But all these can access only a subset of the future of the language and it's up to the user to be sure that you are not going to use features of the languages that then arises uh, to problems when you try to use just-in-time compilation not to speak with uh, compatibility with uh, existing libraries Julia instead has been designed after just-in-time compilation become available and it has really been designed with just-in-time compilation in mind and this means that you don't need to worry about a future of the language that is not compatible with the compilation in particular any types not only the primitive types that are provided natively by the language core but also that you as the programmer define when you create a new structure, a new class, if you want to use a object-oriented ter terminology, can be compiled. And this is important because uh, we are not going to see the Python machine learning stack of applications, but Python has its own container type, the, the list. But then most numerical work in Python uses instead NumPy arrays that is a type provided by a separate pay package. But then, when you go in machine learning with Python, the Python machine learning libraries use other specialized data structure to represent arrays, for example, tensors in PyTorch. So, you have a lot of different types specific for the different libraries that you need to use, while in Julia, you have the arrays in the core of the language, that are somehow equivalent to Python list, but because these arrays are compilable and fast, you have these arrays for everything you need. Any numerical library is compatible with these plain arrays. Going a little bit more technical, Julia has a garbage collector to manage the memory. That is, you don't need to, more, to worry that when you allocate some memory, then you have also to free the memory or you run into overflow errors. You end up the memory available on your machine. But this is done automatically by the garbage collector. When objects are no longer accessible, they are destroyed. To be fair, this is something that all higher level languages have and also some compiled languages. But it's nice that you don't need to worry about memory management like you have to in C or in Fortran. And then, as I was saying, most numerical functionalities are included in core or in the standard library. So it's a sort of battery included for numerical scientific computation. In the sense that you don't need a separate package to provide these functions. Most linear algebra functions are included in core of the language, so you don't need to load uh, another library to use them. And all of these, all these characteristics, imply that we have a programming language that is high level for uh, the programmer. It is very efficient in the sense that it is very expressive. The programmer can perform lots of operations, add to the program a lot of logic with a few statements. But at the same time, Julia program remain efficient also for the hardware, using the computational resources very efficiently. And only if you need, you can uh, tweak the code when uh, it is needed to go even further low level, using, for example, seemed AVUX in bounds statements to specify that you want to use some specific characteristics of modern CPUs or skip bounds checking. This really solves the trade-off between fast coding 
and fast execution but they also have experience with using C++ for computational intensive models but you need to write the type of any variable uh, define any functions before using them uh, take care of the compilation order and sometimes it is a pain and at the other side I, I use Python where you can program very fast but numerical computations can be relatively slow uh, for example using four loops in a Python or R program is going to be very slow so you need to vectorize your code but sometimes your program, your, your problem is not easy uh, vectorizable so you need to employ some tricks to vectorize your code here you don't need them in Julia you want the code operates on matrix and, uh, and vectors that's fine you want to use scalars and use for loops it's fine as well both will be fast so you can use uh, the uh, approach that is more appropriate to the problem that you have on hand one very important consequence is that this leads to very fast development of the libraries that in Julia we call packages because these don't need to be written in another language to be efficient but they can be written in the same language than those where they will be used and this means that is, it is much easier if you know already the language as you are using the library to then cross the barrier and from a user of the library becoming a contributor of it to hack the library and contribute modifications to the library by yourself here I show you uh, these screenshots come from GitHub. We will see in a moment that GitHub is a website that hosts source code. And for each project, it gives you some statistics, including in which language uh, the project is coded. So for Python libraries, for example, you see uh, that NumPy, that is a library that manage numerical and dimensional arrays, you can see that here that a large part is in C and in Cyton, uh, not to be confounded with C Python. Uh, C Python is the standard implementation of Python, while Cyton is essentially another language in the middle to C and Python to hello uh, to convert some restricted uh, Python code in C uh, automatically. And you can see but a very large part of uh, the library, the most intensive uh, part, is not in Python. So in Python here you have all the interface parts, but the core of the library, uh, the most numerical intensive parts, uh, are not Python. And this means that it is very difficult for a Python programmer to go and modify the library itself. So if all you need is using the library, you are fine, it will be fast, it will not be slower, much slower than, than Julia. It will be fast, but that's actually because uh, it is compiled. But if you need to do something that is not provided by your library, you are doing some research, if you are doing some projects where you need to do something new, that is not covered by an existing library. With Python, you, m you may be in troubles if uh, speed matters. Here is uh, Pandas. The, the Python part is, uh, is uh, larger here, but still the computationally intensive parts are not in Python. And even if they seem relatively uh, less frequent, even a single line of non-Python code means that to develop the library you need to set up a specific infrastructure on your PC. Have, for example, a, a, a C compiler. PyTorch is a leading library in Python for machine learning. And again, you can see that uh, Python here is even a minority only 36% of the code is written in, in Python. The same for R. Uh, 
Uh, data table is uh, the equivalent of pandas in, uh, in Python and uh, data frames in Julia to manage uh, tabular data. Here, I didn't make a copy of uh, these screenshots. Data frames flux, a machine learning library in Julia and uh, beta ML, our own machine learning library, these are all 100% uh, uh, Julia libraries. So this really tell you that to write efficient libraries in Julia, you can use Julia itself. You don't need uh, to resort to C or C++. Conversely, these tell you that when you want to do something that is performant, you cannot use only Python or R or, or MATLAB. You need to use uh, these two languages. One, efficient, compiled, but slow to develop language for the computational intensive task. And then another one to glue the parts together. So Julia solves this problem by having at the same time something efficient for the programmer but also efficient at the level of the hardware. And this is one of the many reasons that we are going to use Julia in this course. Because this means that our libraries are also in Julia. So our machine learning libraries are in Julia. And if you know Julia, we can understand what's written in. And uh, while if I take a Python machine learning library, okay, I can tell you, I can describe you how to use it, which arguments to put in the function calls and so on. But at the end, I cannot go further and tell you how this is actually implemented. Because this will not be in Python, will be done in C, so I need to explain. You see, well here in Julia, I can show you how the library implement, for example, a neural network. Here I list another important characteristic, that is Julia is a reflective language. In brief, it means in Julia you can analyze and modify not only the elements that you define in the code as the variables, the functions or the modus, but the expressions themselves that the code defines. And this leads to the possibility to do metaprogramming, to write macros that are very uh, flexible. If you know C or C++, you have macros also there, but you can replace some uh, large chunks of uh, codes with something much smaller. And uh, doing the compilation preprocessing, these small markers are replaced with the full code expression. I use them, for example, when I have uh, lots of uh, nested for loops. However, this is done at the level of the text of the code. So before the text is interpreted by the compiler, you can have some text pattern matching, not much different than uh, when you do a uh, find a replace in your favorite, favorite text editor but it remains something at the level of the text. Instead, with uh, reflective uh, uh, languages and metaprogramming, you really first parse the text that define your code. And then you can operate at the level of the abstract syntax tree, that is the representation of the code in a sort of trees of uh, operations and you can be much more precise, more powerful in the ability to change the code because it's no longer just a text, but it's something that has been already organized in a structure. The fact that you can use these macros means that you can create much simple domain-specific application programming interface. Users of your library don't need to be restricted by a very rigid syntax, like for example those of Piomo. Here, Jump and Piomo are very similar libraries to solve optimization problems, something similar to the likes of GAMS or AMP. 
that are specialized algebraic modeling languages to solve mathematical optimization problems. Piomo is a library for Python, an open source library, and Jump is an equivalent one for Julia. We will see it, we'll have some slides about it. But what I want to say now is that if you know Piomo, its syntax is pretty rigid and uh, verbose because you have to code invalid Python syntax and hence a bit more inconvenient to use compared to a language that has been specifically designed for mathematical optimization like GAMS. While with Jump, using macros, we have the advantage to remain within the realm of a general programming language like Julia with all the advantage in terms of interface possibilities and tools available. But at the same time, we are free to write the model in a way using a syntax that is adapted to mathematical optimization modeling. It is the macro, macro that then converts our simple handmade code to some more verbose code that is fed to the Julia interpreter. Another key characteristic of Julia is that it is able to dispatch at runtime run a function call to the proper implementation according to the types of the function parameter. So you have a function with a certain name, let's say foo, and it takes two parameters, x and y. We can have multiple implementations of this function depending on the types of x and y. And then when the program call foo xy, this call will be dispatched to the correct version according indeed to the types of x and y. This property is called multiple dispatch and it is a generalization of the object-oriented model. Why? Because the object-oriented model is indeed a single dispatch model. When you have the function x.4 uh, or y.4, uh, this is equivalent to foo xx or foo y. In classical object-oriented languages, these calls can be dispatched according to the type of x and y respectively, but it is not possible to dispatch according to multiple arguments as it is in Julia. Multiple dispatch has two important consequences. The first obvious one is that you can simplify the API of your library as you don't need to write foo1, foo2, foo3 for different types if these functions have the same logic but they implement it differently because of the different uh, parameters. To be fair, this is also possible in object-oriented languages with function overloading. There, however, the types must be known at compile time, not at runtime as in uh, uh, multiple dispatch. The second uh, remarkable consequence, uh, a bit unexpected, is that multiple dispatch facilitates that different libraries that have uh, nothing in common, that they have been developed by different authors, know nothing one uh, about the other, when used together, they often work well together with the types defined in one library for which they haven't specifically adapted. Let's say how this is possible. Here on this code, I first create two matrices, X and Y. And then I implement a personalized uh, version of uh, division, the function my divide, X, uh, Y. Here I create a generic version that, uh, guess what, divide x by y. Here I use, uh, um, my, my user case requires that I do a so-called integer division using the percent symbol. For example, the integer division between 8 and 3 returns 2. 
and finally here I create another version for when y is a matrix. So these three are three functions that I define. Assume that uh, this uh, my divide is a low level function and I have a high level function uh, foo that does something. Here it makes a multiplication and then it calls this my divide uh, function. Here you can see that we can call foo with uh, two integers, with an integer and a float and with two matrices. In all cases we will have the right job uh, done. You can compute it. Behind the scenes, at each of these calls, the Julia compiler will compile three different versions of uh, Foo, one uh, uh, at each uh, call. But what is interesting is that Foo doesn't need to know anything about the types. It can somehow delegate the type-specific logic to the lower level functions. As soon as the multiplication operator, in this case uh, natively, and the myDivide uh, customly written functions work with uh, 2, 3, 1.5, x and uh, y, then this is fine for the full function, the high level one. So high level functions in different packages can work even with types that they weren't initially taught to work with. As soon as what they do makes sense for the types, that is the lower level functions work with them. Another key characteristic that again we'll see in detail when we study the language in more details is that C and uh, Fortran libraries can be called uh, directly and uh, because uh, virtually all programming languages have an interface with C, we can use this interface to call a library written in uh, that language or embed in our Julia code segments in other languages and call the R, Python, uh, whatever language interpreter to execute that code or the opposite, embed the Julia libraries or code in other programming language programs. We have three levels we can play with other languages, libraries or code. We can be so jig uh, that we use the C call uh, directly by ourselves, not me. Uh, we can use uh, language specific libraries that use the C interface and, ma and make the job much easier. I wrote here the two packages for uh, Python, PyCall and R, uh, RCall. We'll see about this. Or because using PyCall or RCall is so easy, many leading packages has been already wrapped in a Julia package using them. Uh, for example, SymPy, a Python library for symbolic computations, differentiate uh, y equal to x squared plus 2, has been wrapped in some SymPy.jl, so a uh, Julia package. So the third way is to just use the wrapped uh, Julia package and forget that behind there there is a Python, R or C++ uh, uh, library. So while Julia is uh, relatively uh, new, on one side it has already a large set of native packages, but for more esoteric stuff you can always rely to the huge set of libraries already wrote for other languages. Julia is devoted to performant numerical code. It isn't strange then that having a first class support of parallel programming models was a priority. There are two main uh, parallel programming models, multi-threads and multi-process. 
Julia fully su support them and offer higher level functions to help. Multithread support means you can use all the cores of your CPU or use often with minimal or no changes to your code, depends on the library you use, the new graphical processing units, the GPU, uh, the Google TPU, uh, etc. There isn't any global interpreter lock as in Python or the need to use external multi-threaded libraries to get true multi-threading uh, program. On the other hand, with multi-process uh, support, you can scale the model that you develop on your own la laptop, again with minimal changes to the code, to HPC clusters and supercomputers. There are a few Julia projects running complex models on these huge clusters, like the Celeste project to catalog all the stars of the universe. And the Julia is the only higher level language for which a program has been run at petascale, that is with a computational speeds of more than one petaflops per second. So, these are the big paradigms, but there are other two things that seem a little bit smaller, but they are actually very important. The first one is that Julia is very math friendly. Unicode is uh, fully supported in variable names, so you can name your variable uh, alpha, uh, beta squared, uh, you can also use tilts, bars, superscripts, it is here in this presentation software that I can't use them, but you can use uh, uh, almost all uh, Unicode uh, representations. Also, everything in Julia sees a name made of some digits plus a string, it interprets it directly as a product, so you can write things like uh, uh, true alpha di directly. These two things seem synthetic sugar, but uh, they really help in keeping the code you write in Julia very close to its uh, mathematical representation, to what you write in your paper or a report. It's maybe not the main technical innovation, but this is, it is very practical uh, and I love it. One final point that I left for last, but it is also very important and it is the only one that we will see in more details later today. And I start from the effects here. I believe that when we do produce a scientific paper or an analysis or some sort of reports, there should be a way to document all the steps we take and we should deliver to the editor, to the customer or to the public something that is really transparent and reproducible. Not only research. Think about a report. We need to decide if a project, uh, think uh, an airport, just to say something that in France had been debated at length, should go ahead or not. And we need to weight all the effects of that project. There are many ways to arrive to uh, conclusions. Sometimes you need to run uh, simulations. It will depend on the exact boundaries you put on the system you consider. I believe that it's important that when we do arrive to some conclusions, we fully document all our process, so that others can replicate or just simply understand our method. A bit out of topic, this is why I discourage people to use point-and-click programs to do, for example, GIS spatial analysis. Using a program like ArcGIS or QGIS for visualization is super convenient, but to perform operations that are part of a larger workflow, it is better to use some scripts can can be uh, reproduced. So having reproducible uh, research is for me super important. And here is where Julia shines. Julia 
as a bit a JIT based package manager. This is integrated with the core of the language and it supports very light environments. In Julia, all the packages are stored on a user based directory. And when you create a new environment for a project, all it does is keep track of which exact package and versions your project is using automatically, including all the dependency of the dependency, etc. It, sto it stores this information in a small text file. When you are done, you deliver your code, your input data, and this small file. Anyone, including yourself after 20 years, can then take that file, issue a Julia command, and recreate that exact environment and run your code in the same condition, same environment as you did. If there is no stochasticity in your model or if you had the good care of fixing a specific random seed at the beginning of your program, they will obtain the exact results as you did, guaranteed.